Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hey everybody, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of avsforum.com. Now, I'm at the NAB show here in Las Vegas, National Association of Broadcasters. And you might wonder what a home theater geek is doing here at a professional trade show. I'm looking for all of the cool things that are going to affect what we see as consumers at home. Cameras, lenses, compression algorithms, distribution formats, all the really cool stuff that will define the next generation of television. So let's go check it out. Hey, I'm in the Canon booth talking with Chuck Westfall, the technical advisor, or a technical advisor with Canon, probably one of many, uh, and you're showing us uh, something new in lenses. Absolutely. This is one of the most important new produ product introductions here at NAB 2014. It's our new Cine Servo zoom lens, 17 to 120 millimeter T2.95. Uh, and this is going to open us up to a whole set of new markets for people who are using our Cinema EOS and our regular EOS cameras, as well as uh, broadcasters who are using PL mount, because we have it available in both EF and PL uh, for them. Uh, so the thing that's exciting about this is the fact that that zoom range at, at 17 to 120 is going to cover the vast majority of shooting situations. Um, and uh, although we already have all of our uh, SLR lenses for run and gun and we have all of our EF cinema lenses for the rigs, this is kind of a dual purpose lens in the respect that it can also be used for shoulder mount and it could be used in a studio uh, with a broadcast type situation. Uh, a very, very important new lens in our lineup. And you have it here mounted on a Sony camera, a competitor's camera, just to show that you can actually accommodate a wide range of cameras. Absolutely, because we recognize that uh, uh, there's a whole lot of legacy equipment out there already using the PL mount, and uh, it's very important for uh, our customers to understand that uh, we're looking to place this lens as many uh, installations as possible. Now, I'm most interested at this show in uh, 4K, and zoom lenses such as this, uh, obviously everything starts with the lens. Now, are you going to be able to capture a, a good, crisp 4K image with this lens? Absolutely. That's one of the most important design objectives about it. Um, and we're very strongly promoting the idea that uh, this lens is perfect for 4K capture. Uh, the, the optical quality of it has been designed to match that format and actually exceed the, the needs of that format. Okay, here we are in the simulated uh, control room. What are we looking at? We've got a very exciting application for our 4K capture where basically we feed the live video into a system that is able to actually zoom in on a small portion of the picture and then output that small portion into a full HD signal. So this is being used everywhere in broadcast right now for sports and also for uh, various different commercial applications. I think it's great to, um, now that we have uh, instant replay, I think in baseball was recently announced, and uh, certainly other calls that are questionable, being able to zoom in and see exactly what happened is probably a really good thing. Yeah, because up to now, they've had to start from a full HD. Now they've got four times the resolution to begin with, and it really makes it a lot clearer. Now finally, we have uh, a new reference monitor here, a 4K reference monitor, which is used for grading content, making sure that it looks proper for distribution. Yeah, actually this is uh, the first time now at the show that we're able to actually show the unit that's shipping into the market. We just started shipping it. Um, this is a 30-inch LCD with image plane switching on it. It's a uh, 4096 by 2560 resolution, so you've got your full 4K plus a, uh, a panel below that for your toolbar. Uh, and uh, essentially uh, it can do any kind of color space all the way up to the DCI P3 Plus, which is the largest color space used for motion picture production, and of course it'll do anything uh, you know smaller than that. So uh, this is the perfect uh, complement to our C500, which outputs the raw video in 4K. Looks fantastic. It's uh, getting a fantastic uh, response in the market from all the uh, the DI companies, digital intermediates who are doing all the work. That's great. Thanks so much for talking with us. Our pleasure. Thank you.
Hey, I'm with my good friend John Taylor, VP of Public Affairs at LG. And L, uh, LG doesn't really have a booth here. What are you doing in the Gates Air booth? So Gates Air is our partner to develop what is called FutureCast, which is the next generation broadcast system for television that's part of the ATSC 3.0 process. So tell us a little bit about it. So what we're demonstrating today is the very first time that attendees can see a um, in one six megahertz channel, the transmission of 4K Ultra HD and two mobile streams. Wow, now that must involve a lot of compression. It involves compression. Uh, our part of it is really the transmission layer. It's called the physical layer. And uh, we want to be able to maximize the robustness, make sure you have the most robust indoor reception, and be able to deliver the most throughput. Is this going to be on a regular kind of antenna? So this, this is basically antenna TV. That's mm. what the next generation is all about. But interoperability with other media is also crucial. And uh, you mentioned something about interactive TV? LG is also working here at the show with other partners like the Pearl TV Group, and we're announcing the, uh, the first trial of mobile emergency alerting in Florida right ahead of the, uh, the hurricane season down there to show how broadcasters can harness the power of terrestrial broadcasting to reach consumers with crucial emergency information in a rich media format. Now when will FutureCast be deployed? So FutureCast is part of the ATSC process. There are other proponents. That, that process is on a fast track. We share broadcasters' sense of urgency to move on with the next generation of digital television. So within the next couple of years, uh, this will become a reality. So put FutureCast in context for us, in terms of particularly uh, UHD or 4K as it's coming down the pike. So this is a crucial year for ultra high definition. You know, it really got started last year in the marketplace and the industry sold about 75,000 units. Industry estimates from the Consumer Electronics Association this year are more like half a million. LG is extremely bullish about this market. We think it could reach 900,000 to almost a million units sold in the United States in 2014. Uh, we're doing our part. We had five models last year. We've expanded our line significantly, uh, bringing to market a dozen new ultra high definition sets in 2014. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm in the HDMI licensing booth talking with Jeff Park, the technology specifications manager, and finally we have HDMI 2.0. Yes, we do. It was launched in September of uh, last year, 2013, and it was released to all the manufacturers. Now they're taking advantage of the new technology that was specified in this new specification, and they'll be releasing more products throughout the year. Uh, typically what happens is the specification is released, and in about a year time, they need time to develop, make new chips, new products, and so on, and software. And the following year, which will be this, this year fall, you'll see a large number of uh, 2.0 products uh, based on the new technology. Now, the new technology has increased the bandwidth almost by a factor of two. Yes. The bandwidth has increased now to 18 gigabits per second to allow for a much higher frame rate of 4K. So HDMI has supported 4K since uh, 2009 when HDMI 1.4 was released. But now with the introduction of 2.0 specification, we have bumped the bandwidth up to 18 gigabits, which allows you to have 4K 60 experience at 444 encoding, or all the way up to uh, 4K at 120 hertz, or even at 4K at 16 bit color using 420 encoding. Now, you do bump into that bandwidth limitation if you want to go beyond 420 uh, at more than eight bits, right? Correct, correct. C currently, we're limited to 4K 60, 8-bit 444 if you're doing 444. Uh, however, we believe that since most of the digital content that's being released uh, initially is to be for 4K, it will be in 420 anyway, so quality loss or any loss in fidelity would be very minimal, if not uh, none at all mm -hmm. uh, in most cases. And uh, what's the roadmap for the future? I mean, if there's a 2.0, there must be a 2.1 coming. Yes, we're always working on new uh, technologies to add to the specification, uh, but with anything, it, it takes time, and we usually don't uh, announce roadmaps uh, because there's it's very fluid. There's a lot of companies being involved. There's over 70 companies right now developing the HDMI technology, so we never know which direction we're going to go because so many companies are involved. But I can all, all I can tell you now is we're working on something, uh, and we'll see what, when that's released. One one of the things I want to just make sure we touch upon is the use of the term HDMI 2.0. Now a lot of companies use that term. But it really doesn't say too much, does it? Correct. Um, we've always 
pushed or had marketing rules that discouraged the use of version numbers because version number was always intended for manufacturers. So manufacturers take the specification and say, okay, I need to use this version to build my product because I want certain features. Same applies for the 2.0 specification. It's just a, a, a version of the specification does not denote, say, features. For example, if 2.0, what does that mean, right? Does it mean it includes 4K60, dual view, 32 channels of audio? It really doesn't mean it includes versions from an end-user perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're doing here internally, the, um, the HTMI forum working group is look, looking to create new marketing guidelines. Um, what that means, we don't know yet. Because as with any committee, it takes time to kind of process things. Right. Um, so we'll have new marketing rules. But right now, what the consumer need to do, as they've always uh, done in the past, is look for the features you want. So let's say I want 4K 3D. Then look for the devices that have 4K 3D. Regardless of what their marketing version number says, just look for that feature, and then you'll be okay with it. I hope the manufacturers take heed, because this would be a really good thing. Thanks so much for talking with us. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm in the JVC booth talking with Dave Walton, Assistant Vice President of Marketing and Communications. And Dave, there's a lot of camera news here in the JVC booth, isn't there? Lots of camera news. We have our Pro HD series here that we've upgraded and we've added to with live streaming capabilities from the GY HM890. We're doing actual live streams from California right here into the booth. It's taken off very well. Stations all over the country are buying these for ENG News. We're also showing some new technology. Since we acquired a uh, image sensor company a few years back, We've developed our own imager, and these are the first JVC cameras to actually feature that imager. It's a large image sensor, a CMOS device, a super 35 millimeter, 13.6 megapixels, and we can do full 4K at 60p, or we can do HD at up to 240p, so we can do super slow motion. So it's very cool. And we have it featured in four different cameras. The first is the what we call the Elise, which is a GYLS-X1. It's a large imager shoulder style camcorder that has a PL mount for cinematography and uh, it's the full, most feature rich camera and it will record full 4K up to 60p, which is very important, and it will also output live 4K signals. So it does all the deburring and everything right in the camera processor. We have a smaller handheld version of that, which does up to 30p. It's called the GYLS X2, and it's a very tiny camera, and because it's smaller, we decided to use a micro four thirds inch lens mount, but it's in front of a super 35 millimeter sensor, so we can we get the advantages of a small mount, but a large sensor as well. Now, the, the, the smaller lens, though, still has the resolution to capture 4K. Well, certainly, and it, obviously there are so many more lenses available in that uh, micro four-thirds inch realm, but and a lot less expensive than PO lenses. So, uh, it, it, the, the camera itself is targeted for a market that probably doesn't want to spend the kind of money you'd spend if you're buying all PL mount lenses. Then we also have a two-piece camera, which is a very tiny uh, 4K camera that uh, has a separate electronics unit that records and uh, I, I also should mention that all of these cameras can stream live video, not stream 4K, but stream live HD, which is kind of important if you're going to say mount one to a drone and fly it around. Uh, we developed the gimbal for image stabilization just for that camera. So we've got a gimbal version of the camera or as a two-piece camera, you could mount it on a boom, a crane or whatever. But as a gimbal type camera, you can hold this uh, with handlebars, mount it on a boat, a motorcycle, or as you said, a drone and fly it around and do some spectacular things in 4K. Now that tiny little camera that can be mounted on a UAV uh, also has this cool head-mounted display controller. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, first of all, the camera can stream, so it's not going to be streaming 4K, but it'll be streaming HD. And that's over the cellular network directly to the internet. Right. Uh, or could be through a Wi-Fi network. Well, you might not have Wi-Fi everywhere, but let's say you're streaming, you need to see what's uh, going on on the camera. So we developed a little head-mounted display here that has a liquid crystal on silicone uh, 
display device in here and it's mounted right to a pair of glasses. There's even a HD camera in there if you have a use for that. But this is very cool. So you can stand there and you can actually see what the aircraft sees. Can't wait to try one, man. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. Thanks so much. Sure. Hey, I'm in the NHK booth. This is the public broadcasting system of Japan, and I'm talking with Hiroyuki Kaneko, who is with the PR department, and we're talking about 8K, as if 4K wasn't enough. Yeah, 8K is the ultimate 2D TV system, and uh, then uh, 8K has a 16 times le resolution than current HD TV, which is quite a bit. Now, you're talking here at this show about actually transmitting 8K over the air. Uh, yes, we are showing over the air uh, transmission technology. At this time, we are showing live demonstration. Which is uh, an antenna actually sh uh, transmitting and another antenna receiving right here in the booth. Ah, uh, yes. Now, to get 8K transmitted over the air requires a pretty serious compression, doesn't it? Ah, uh, yes. We are researching on the HEVC, High Efficiency Video Coding Technology. And, and that gets you enough compression to be able to squirt it through the air like that? Ah, uh, yes. Very good. So in addition to 8K video, we're talking about 22.2 channel audio for the first time delivered in a home package. Tell us about it. Yeah. Here we are showing uh, front panel display uh, loudspeakers uh, for home use. Uh, These speakers um, can reproduce 3D audio. And you have them mounted around the frame of a large flat panel TV here. Uh, we, we're not, you're not using 22 speakers, are you? Ah, uh, yes. This system use only 12 speakers. So when might we expect to see this in stores? Yeah, at this time, this system is a prototype just now. So you're just using it for research right now. It's going to be a few years. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. Okay, here in the Fraunhofer booth, I'm talking with Benjamin Bross, uh, project manager, about HEVC, otherwise known as H.265, the new encoding algorithm that's going to allow 4K to be streamed and broadcast uh, more easily. Tell us about it. Yes. First, you get the name and the numbers right. That's <laughs> it's impressive uh, because they are two standards and you get them both right. So uh, what we're presenting here is one year after the standard was published, we already show solutions that are enable real-time decoding and encoding uh, at a very high quality. So the, uh, the goal of that HEVC project, uh, where I was the editor, so I wrote the specification text, uh, is able to provide 50% bitrate reduction. So that's the theory. 50% compared with the previous generation H.264. Right, that's the bitrate reduction compared to H.264. Uh, and now everyone is working on solutions to provide that 50%. And only one year after the standard was published, it was published in April last year, we have already a significant reduction with what HD solution we are presenting here is 19% overhead bitrate overhead to the theoretical HM reference encoder. Now I heard uh, yesterday in a talk that uh, we, re we, practically speaking, we're only getting a 30% increase or decrease in bitrate, uh, increase in efficiency, practically speaking. The, the theoretical limit is 50%, but you're saying we're getting closer to that now. Yeah, it also depends on uh, what's your measurement and uh, what's your reference for the same quality. And the 50% is for the same subjective quality. Uh, and you have an objective quality measure, but people are watching video. So it's like for the same subjectively equal quality, half the bit rate. And uh, I think we get there in, in some years. So it's not like we will end up with 30. I think give us one more year or one and a half more years and we, we give you the 50. That's I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks, God. Also in the Fraunhofer booth is a very interesting camera rig called a light field camera. And I'm talking with Siegfried Fussel about it. Uh, what can you tell us? Yeah, typically you have only one camera where you capture the scene. We are capturing the scene from different point of views. And uh, with this approach, you capture the complete light field of a scene, not only one specific uh, view. And then you can, uh, in the post-production, 
uh, make different special effects out of it. You can refocus, for example, the image. You can also virtual make a virtual camera movement uh, and also make some vertigo or dolly effects, which you can typically only do by mechanical movement of cameras. Now, will this allow uh, end users to manipulate the image, or would you not want that to happen? Our approach is first for more the professional uh, guys, means for the entertainment industry. Uh, for the end consumer, it's more uh, like uh, something like plain optic cameras. We also investigated this, uh, but uh, the problem with the plain optic cameras is that you have a micro lens array in front of a sensor and you have only a very limited uh, 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 variation in point of views. That's the reason why we created this camera array uh, and uh, you can also make it uh, even larger and then you have more options uh, to uh, uh, differentiate in the point of views. Would it also allow 3D reproduction? Sure. So uh, as I said you can uh, make a virtual camera out of uh, uh, this camera array and you can also do two or more cameras as virtual cameras and this allows you uh, also to change the baseline of three uh, vir virtual 3D camera setup. That means uh, uh, you have not to make uh, all of the adjustments uh, on the set, you can do this later in post. Fantastic, thanks so much. Okay, you're welcome. Finally, a moment of respite. We're inside a sound isolation booth in uh, the Fraunhofer IIS booth at NAB, and I'm talking with Stefan Meltzer, a uh, technology consultant here for Fraunhofer, and uh, you've got some pretty big news at the show, don't you? Yeah, we have uh, some interesting news about immersive audio and uh, the inductivity you can use with MPEG-H 3D audio. It's a new standard coming up from MPEG. <clears throat> and we also, for people who are not able to put all the number, high number of speakers in their living room, we have a sound frame behind you, uh, which allows you, like a soundbar today, to give immersive 3D audio to consumers. Now, uh, this is a somewhat adaptive technology, as I understand it, where it's, is it channel-based or is it object-based? It's a combination of both. Mm. So what we do is we have a channel bed for the ambience, and on top of this we have objects for the uh, dialogue or for special effects or for optional additional uh, commentary. Like in a car race, you could imagine that you have the commentary normally, and in addition you can select the team radio of your preferred driver. This kind of uh, additional inductivity and personalization for the user at the end. Now, is this going to be part of the ATSC 3.0 broadcast standard? It might be. We're proposing it to ATSC, and we will see how the selection will go. <laughs> And then this uh, sound bar, it's not really a sound bar, is it? It's, uh, but it's uh, simulating a surround sound with a f just a few speakers around the TV. It's, uh, it's not simulating surround sound, it's simulating the 3D uh, sound, so immersive audio. And so that's maybe, let's say, an uh, extension of the sound bar to a sound frame. So when do we expect to see this uh, implemented in consumer products? So this is a prototype here, what we where show the concept. And uh, up to now, we have quite positive response from people listening to it. So the quality is very nice. And now it's up to the consumer electronic manufacturers to, to take this up and, and use this. The problem we have nowadays with audio on TVs is that the TV is getting thinner and thinner. So people start using sound bars to compensate for this. And if you want to go really to the immersive audio parts, then we would like to show this uh, sound frame as the new uh, way forward for the audio. Great. Thanks for talking with us. You're welcome. Here in the Panasonic booth, I'm talking with Carl Demands, the product manager, one of the product managers here at Panasonic Pro. Uh, and one of the three things we're going to look at today is this ultra short throw projector that's uh, being displayed right here behind us within a rock wall. What can you tell us about it? Uh, it's actually one of the greatest products that we have here at Panasonic. It's an 8500 ANSI Lumen WUXGA projector that has an le interchangeable lens that is the world's shortest throw lens, 0 .038 throw distance, which means you can project a 150 inch image in about four feet of throw distance. What we've done here is taking it one step further. You're taking an incredibly bright 8500 ANSI lumen, hanging a second projector, mapping it directly over the first, and doubling the bright out brightness output. So it can compete with the uh, showroom floor pretty easily. Oh, absolutely. Showroom floors, uh, house of worship type applications, uh, rental and staging applications where you want the people to get up and close to the image, be able to touch it without blocking the overall, curating the shadow effect of blocking the uh, projected image. 
Okay, here we are over with the laser projector. Tell us about this. I've always been very interested in laser projectors, and they've been somewhat impractical, I guess, until now. Oh, that, that's for sure. Actually, one of the greatest limitations in projection technology is the fact that, you know, once every six months or a year, you have to get up there and replace a lamp. Well, the new laser technology means that we have a lamp-free projector uh, available to the market. You're talking something that runs about 20,000 hours without having to replace any filter, any lamp, anything at all. Now, 20,000 hours, it's not a product you want to get rid of. It's still going to look good for you. It's just not going to be as bright as we would want for the spec. Now this is for commercial installations as well, right? This is for commercial installations, but we also see you going into a variety of other uh, unique applications, such as sports bars. Uh, here's folks that really want to create bright, beautiful, spectacular images, uh, and the continuous operation really saves them from having to you know, get a guy on a ladder every six months to replace a lamp. Do we have uh, a brightness spec on this? Sure, it comes in at 6,000 ANSI lumens. Uh, basically, it will support uh, a number of different inputs, including HDMI, DVI, DisplayPort, and actually Digital Link, which pr allows you to pr uh, push full 1080p content with audio and control over a single CAT6 cable to really simplify your installations. And what's the native resolution here? Native resolution on this projector is WUXGA 1920 by 1200, but also will come with a WXGA model, 1366 by 768. Can't wait to see one in the home. Oh, they're going to be great. And finally, we come to this fabulous panel here, uh, Ultra HD, right? That's correct. Actually, it's 98 inches of Ultra HD. Incredible in image quality, true 4K. What you see is native 4K content being displayed on a panel that basically is 500 nits. It's ruggedized for commercial use. One of my favorite demos would be, try that with the consumer set. I would not. But fundamentally, we're trying to bring it into the commercial world for where you want to really have great detail, great contrast ratio, actually world-class uh, contrast ratio coming out of a full 4K panel. And a 10-bit panel, I believe, right? 10-bit video processing. We actually have, the spec is not yet quite finalized on it yet, but world-class contrast ratio higher than what you would see out of most native panels of its kind. I don't suppose there's a price tag on it yet, is there? Not yet. Come back to us around September time frame and we'd be more than happy to quote it for you. I'll be here. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Here in the SpectraCal booth, I'm talking with Derek Smith, CTO and co-founder of the company. And uh, the, the news here is a lot of displays have taken your, a lot of manufacturers have taken your advice with their displays. Tell us about that. Yeah, Scott. What we, uh, last year at NEB, we were talking to the display manufacturers, recommending that they started including 3D LUTs directly in their displays. Most of them took us at face value, and so we've got a lot of manufacturers here. We've got uh, Dolby, Flanders, TV Logic, Azo, the new Dreamcolor 2, the new Panasonic 4K, um, and the list just goes on and on and on. So the need to have external LUT boxes are kind of going away, and so for people that need even better controller calibration, they can just load their 3D LUTs directly into the display. Um, we have them all in our booth and CalMan controls all of them directly. Now for those of those of uh, our viewers who don't understand the term LUT, give us a two-second uh, definition there. So basically LUT is, uh, stands for lookup table and it allows us to do corrections. So we send an RGB signal in, we can modify what happens inside the RGB signal in a 3D kind of space and then we can send that out. And so it gives us more finer control or calibration over the non-linear areas of what the display would have. So the manufacturers took your advice because if they have these LUTs in their displays, you don't need an external box. Saves them money, saves the user money, and uh, now you can calibrate these TVs with ever greater uh, accuracy. Yes, we're getting a much, much higher calibration. Um, normally our calibration standards are you know, in delta E's, and we usually say delta E of 3 or 1. On some of these displays with 3D LUTs, we're getting a delta E of 0 0.2, <laughs> with an average of 0.2 and the, and the worst case of a 0.4. Wow. So I mean, they're absolutely just perfectly dialed in. I'm talking with Gear Skoden, Senior Vice President at DTS, and uh, DTS Headphone X is really taking off, isn't it? Yeah, Scott. Uh, this year we're uh, showing the first products shipping with Headphone X, and we're also showing streaming and media delivery live over Dash, HLS, and Smooth Streaming. And together with partners like Next Streaming and Cast Labs, we're showing next generation video players. They're able to support ultraviolet, 
Uh, they're supporting our layered audio technology, which allows you to stream co content with Headphone X in an efficiency that's unprecedented so far. Yeah, so we're very excited about the momentum and the fact that the industry overall is looking to deliver a better mobile experience. And when doing that, it's been pretty clear that um, audio is a key component for engaging audiences on mobile devices. The screens are smaller and most of users are on headphones, which uh, is a perfect medium for Headphone X, so we're very excited. I uh, saw a uh, study recently that I think you commissioned about the impact of audio versus the impact of increasing video quality, and audio turned out to be much more important. Yeah, the, uh, this was a neuroinsight study that measures people's brain activity when they were enjoying content on tablets, and it was a 60% enjoyment while using Headphone X over normal stereo. On the other hand, we could measure no difference in enjoyment as video quality varied from 240p to 48p to 1080p. Mm. So if you're uh, distributing premium content on video to mobile devices, ensuring that you have a high-end audio experience like Headphone X is gonna make a huge difference in how engaged your audience and how much you're enjoying the, the content. That's great, thanks so much. Thank you. Here in the Christie booth, I'm talking with Don Shaw, Senior Director of Product Management. And Don, I understand there are some new developments in the world of digital cinema. Hi, Scott. Absolutely. Among the various Pro AV stands we have here at the Christie booth, one thing we're really proud to bring to NAB in the Christie Innovation Theater is a six primary laser projection system. Now, wait a second. I thought there were only three primaries. Yeah, that's a great question. So for six primary 3D, what you actually have is uh, one projection system with one set of RGB primaries for your left eye, then a slightly different set of RGB primaries for the right eye. The primaries themselves have a 20 nanometer separation between them, so you can use Dolby 3D glasses, specially tuned Dolby 3D glasses, to filter out the image for the correct eye. Right. This is the other 3D type uh, besides polarization. Yeah, it's totally different than polarization-based 3D. And what we're showing in our innovation theater is just how much more efficient this is than polarization-based 3D. So with 6P 3D, we can actually produce over 40% efficiency versus somewhere in the mid-20s range with the best solution available today with Xenon Labs. And this is with laser illumination as well. Absolutely. So it's really bright. No problem for us to produce 14-foot Lambert 3D on any size cinema screen. Now, um, also uh, at Christie for the last couple of years, you've been showing high frame rate, and that's, I assume, also in there as well. It's all part of it. We've got a, a high frame rate demo in our booth as well. So coming through the laser projector, we have a special trailer from The Hobbit, Desolation of Smog, and we're screening that at 14 foot Lambert's brightness, 48 frames per second frame rate. It's, it, it, I bet you it, sound, it looks beautiful. I can't wait to go see it. Uh, when do we expect to see laser projection deployed in commercial cinemas? We'll be shipping laser projectors to commercial cinemas this year. And they're 4K resolution, right? Absolutely. Now, what about dynamic range? Are, are, with lasers, are you able to increase the dynamic range that you see on the screen? Lasers offer a lot of opportunities for dynamic range. I mean, for one thing, you can build higher contrast projection systems. You have wider color gamuts. And we're working in our labs right now with, with other industry partners on high dynamic range solutions for cinema. Can't wait to see it. Thanks so much. Hey, we got inside the Christie Theater before the next showing of the demo, and I'm talking with Patrick Artiaga, the Director of Business Development here, about a new sound system from Christie. Now, Christie, everybody knows, is a projector company. How'd you get into audio? Well, the uh, aspect of our audio development has taken place probably over the last four or five years, kind of taking our, our technology aspects and looking at audio solutions from a whole new perspective. Uh, some of the key things we've developed is our ribbon driver technology, with our own line array and also the introduction of Class D amplifiers. So taking these three critical elements and putting together a complete audio system for both cinema application and non-cinema applications. And, and their line arrays, there's no horn tweeter to be found. Correct, correct. Uh, one of the unique elements of this is taking all the benefits of, of a line array philosophy design concept, but developing it as a single enclosure. So hopefully this helps in, in installation benefits and also long-term operation of its use in a cinema or non-cinema application. Well, certainly the line array gives you good controlled vertical dispersion and wide horizontal dispersion, which would uh, seem to me to be very good for imaging within the entire theater. Absolutely, and it works perfectly in a cinema application. You know, one of the challenges in, in line arrays in cinema has been how to meet that horizontal and vertical coverage demands, especially with cinema application, very large 
format auditoriums. We've done this with cinema in mind. So we're making sure our, all of our line arrays have 120 degree vertical, uh, excuse me, horizontal coverage. And then each line array has a different vertical coverage based upon its, uh, its environment use. So ranging from a 30 degree vertical all the way up to our larger system, which is a 50 degree vertical. And the, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention was that your surrounds, unlike most theaters where you have a whole wall of surrounds, a line of surrounds across the side, uh, we only have two surrounds in here for a 5.1 system. Correct. So what we've done in giving our customers an option, instead of having a traditional distributed surround array, we've used our especially screen channel arrays and put them in the rear, left rear and right rear. Still gives them that great 5.1 experience, but allows that customer to have that option. Save a little money on installation costs, and you don't have the arguments with the architect about where the light sconce needs to be versus the surround speaker. Now, one last question. You're, uh, you, you mentioned something about this possibly becoming available for home use. Absolutely. I think within Christie, being an entertainment solutions company, we definitely have aspirations to taking this great benefit from cinema and bringing it into the home. So uh, hopefully we can bring a little bit of Hollywood to the home in the years to come. I look forward to it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I found something about HDR, high dynamic range, a subject of great importance to me because I think it really improves the quality of the picture. I'm talking with Alan Chalmers, uh, the Director of Innovation at Go HDR, an offshoot of the University of Warwick and the research that you've done there. Yes, that's right. We're looking at uh, spinning out the uh, commercializing a compression algorithm which allows high dynamic range action to happen and happen now. Right, and this is very important, as I said, because it really improves the quality of the picture even more than more pixels in UHD, doesn't it? Absolutely, because if you've got a very bright scene and with dark areas, you may have lots of pixels, but they could all be under or overexposed. With high dynamic range, you don't have that problem. So HDR actually complements 4K, which makes it very attractive for, you know, if you want to buy a 4K television, you can then also see the full range of lighting in, that, in the scene. Now, do cameras capture that full dynamic range at this point or do they have to be updated? Uh, they need a bit of clever magic which we provide. So basically what you want to do is capture multiple exposures and then merge them into the single HDR frame. Uh, and we have the ability to do that in real time at 30 frames a second. At 30 frames a second, wow that's amazing. Now how long has this uh, research been going on? We've been going for about 10 years, I guess, research. The company spun out about five years ago. Uh, we were way ahead of the market, and only now people are realizing what benefits HDR could have. And that's where we're looking at now actually commercializing it and, and taking it further from there. Now, I'm really interested in this head mounted display. What's this all about? This is the future. Because we want to combine now, we can capture the real world lighting. We want to actually use it in, in a multi sensory experience, whole virtual experience. So once you've got the high dynamic range into the, to the visuals, we can also add smell, 3D sound, feel, etc. So you can have the full experience of life uh, authentically because you've got the high dynamic range video there as well. Can't wait to try that one out. Well, we have to wait a little while, maybe a year we should be ready with this. So we're working on it. As part of our, now we've got the real full HDR pipeline, the next step is to put it into some more sort of, yeah, interesting products as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I ran into John Hatchett here with Go HDR, and uh, tell us about how it is that you can capture high dynamic range with current camera technology. So a lot of our work is to do with using commodity cameras like you see behind me to capture high dynamic range rather than expensive prototype systems. And we have previously built a dual camera system out of Canon 5Ds, but the drawback of using two cameras is the parallax issues you gain. So now we're moving towards single camera solutions. Now before you get there, uh, the two camera solution, you're shooting one of the cameras you're, you're, uh, at one exposure and another camera yeah. at the different exposure? Each, each camera is doing two separate exposures and we're merging four exposures to make a frame of 30 frames per second. Um, our future systems will hopefully look at um, using one camera at a much higher frame rate to gain four or five exposures at 30 frames a second. But the problem with one camera is, is uh, something called ghosting? So yes, at the moment our current cameras are running at 60 frames a second, merging three exposures, which gives you quite a large amount of ghosting per frame. But this is obviously something I feel we can eliminate in the future and come up with a much more seamless view. With a very high frame rate? With a very high frame rate, yes. Well, good luck to you. Thank you. Here in the Dolby booth, I'm talking with Chilla Anderson, the Senior Product Marketing Manager at Dolby, and uh, we're talking about Dolby Vision, and there's some big news today regarding Dolby Vision, the high dynamic range technology that I'm incredibly impressed by. Yes, indeed. Uh, what we're showing here at NEB is that the content creation pipeline is ready for Dolby Vision, and we're featuring that with one of our key partners, Filmlight. The baseline color grading tool has been known for a high-end color grading as a high-end color grading system. So what we show is how to create content in Dolby Vision, supporting Dolby Vision in the baseline tool. 
And so soon, hopefully, we will actually see content graded for Dolby Vision. Then we need displays that will show it. And we know at CES, Vizio showed some TVs. Do you have other TV partners that will expect to see Dolby Vision implemented? Yeah, this year is going to be Vizio, and uh, yes, they're planning to uh, have this place on the market by end of this year, and then uh, soon followed by other partners early next year. A couple at CES, we actually showed prototypes with Sharp and TCL as well. Well, this is wonderful news to know that the production pipeline is now in place because you can have these high dynamic range TVs, but if you only send them what is currently available, it's not going to take full advantage. Yeah, uh, that's correct. So we, we're now able to create uh, content. We have the right technology for it. And we have also uh, studios that can't wait to get into this pipeline and facilities, their partner facilities who are ready to go. So we actually already working with a couple of those and stay tuned for the news who those are. But yes, titles are getting graded as we speak and uh, it will be very soon. Uh, revealed and there will be content by end of this year on those displays. Now we have also here a new uh, Dolby Vision prototype display with a maximum light output of 2,000 nits? Yes, correct. So here we're showing first an NAB, these uh, pr new prototypes displays that could be potentially used in the color correction workflow and uh, they are up to 2,000 nits capable so they're very bright and they're also very light displays so they suitable for on-set, they're suitable for reviews, they're suitable in a facility on, on a desktop uh, type of uh, arrangement as well. That's just great. I can't wait to see it. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm here in the Data Color booth talking with David Toby, Product and Technology Manager here. And uh, David, I'm going around the show talking about 4K. And I know that Data Color is involved with measurement and calibration. And uh, I want you to tell me how important that is in general, but also specifically now that we 4K is on its way in here. Well, we're all you know kind of cranking up our act in terms of resolution, in terms of uh, you know color dynamic range, and it, you know bit depth. So when you when you have all of this increased capability, it would be kind of a shame not to use it accurately. So data color is all about the standards and the accuracy that you can use for capture and display and output. So it is. And uh, are there anything, is there anything new we have to be concerned with in terms of 4K? You mentioned bit depth, uh, certainly a wider color gamut. We need uh, standards for that. I'm a little concerned that we don't have s clear cut standards for gamut, dynamic range, bit depth, uh, color subsampling. Well, there, all of those things are more open fields in video than they are, say, in still photography, where there are such standards. So we very much miss them when we're working in the video field. And we would like to bring. Uh, kind of consistent standards to video, uh, working with what's here now and, and what needs to be here to make it work in the future. So that's part of our long-term goal. In the short term, we're trying to provide tools that people can work with today with the processes they do use. And I believe you have some tools to show us. Well, yes, we're just announcing today at this show our new product, Spider HD, which is a bundle designed for both still and motion process. So this is capture tools and display tools, display being a very wide uh, range of devices these days. Mm. So, um, so what I have here in my lap is a Spider HD kit and this is uh, you know, a, a case capable of being you know, taken on site and it has in it a range of products. We have our, our uh, Spider Checker which is both a color target and on the backs of these there are gray cards so you can use this uh, what's particularly critical for DSLR video is it's really JPEG quality. You have to get the white balance and exposure right in camera. So you flip these cards over and you can do a, a white balance on site with each camera as you work. You can also use this for color profiling. So that is uh, one component of this. We also have our Spider Cube, which is a superb tool for RAW. So if you're shooting black magic, camera red, or if you're shooting still RAW, this tool will help you determine your lighting conditions, your white balance, and your exposure conditions. Uh, I won't go into explaining how that works here, but trust me. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the key product in any spider bundle is a spider. So <laughs> we're looking at, uh, this is a, a seven channel colorimeter, and what it's going to do is, is allow you to measure 
any type of display, everything from your iPhone and your iPad on up to your $20,000 reference display. The question is, what software do you use with each type of display for calibration? So we have a new first in the world product, which is the Spider 4 Elite HD software, which will calibrate both computer displays, which is one process, and reference and uh, field displays, which is a totally separate process, all with the same piece of software. And is this available now, this kit? This is uh, being released today, so it should be in distribution today, so it should be available for those who are interested in it. And what are we talking about price-wise? Well, the, uh, the list price on this is uh, $349 US. Not bad for, uh, for making sure that what you're shooting and what you're seeing is accurate. Well, it certainly saves time and money in the long run to calibrate as you work. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Okay, here in the Sony booth, I'm talking with Mark Weir, the Senior Technology Manager at Sony Digital Imaging. And the big news at the Sony booth is the uh, is this camera you're holding right here in your hand. Tell us about it. Yes, this is the Alpha 7S. This is our latest full-frame interchangeable lens digital camera. It's been optimized for sensitivity and dynamic range. We're starting to break through the limits of camera sensitivity for low light performance and dynamic range in capturing range from highlight to shadow. So it's going to be a great camera for still photographers, but videographers and movie makers are going to really love it as well because of its low light sensitivity and its high dynamic range. It's great for video. Not only that, but you're going to be able to shoot 4K. Absolutely. It becomes one of the only cameras ever made that can capture 4K video on a full frame image sensor. So if you, even though the camera is very small and light, you can see inside that we use a full frame image sensor, um, about twice the size of the image sensors that even very high-end professional interchangeable lens video cameras have. But the real story of the Alpha 7S is its wonderful low light capability and wide dynamic range. What, uh, what kind of dynamic range are we talking about? How many stops? We haven't spec'd it yet, but if you can imagine the pixel size of a full frame image sensor with just 12 megapixels, 8.3 megapixels used for capturing 4K video, you can get a pretty good idea of the range from highlight to shadow that this camera can, uh, uh, can realize. Additionally, we've also used the high sensitivity of the camera to really improve the AF performance. This camera can autofocus in light as low as minus 4 EV, almost in complete darkness. So uh, it's going to be really offer some breakthrough performance. We have the 4K recording done on an external recorder. We can record high bitrate full HD video internally, but we intentionally go to an external recorder for 4K so that we can maintain the small and compact size of the camera. Indeed, it's the world's smallest and lightest interchangeable lens full frame camera. Okay, so you can see it set up here with a production rig. We're using a Zeiss CP Prime 85 millimeter lens designed to operate with a native lens mount, a matte box. We have uh, XLR input audio, but the star of the show here is the new Atmos Shogun 4K external recorder. It's one of the very first available that can record 4K from an HDMI input. So we're taking HDMI output of the camera, we're outputting 422 4K video, and it's being recorded right here on the external recorder. So as you can see, you have a very compact, high-performance camera that appeals to still photographers, but yet is flexible and extensible enough to appeal even for video production. And when will this be uh, released and how much will it cost? Well, unfortunately, we haven't announced the pricing or the timing, but I, I'm sure most everyone will imagine that it'll be coming to market pretty soon. Thanks so much for talking with us. Thanks so much. Well, that's it from NAB. There's way too much stuff here to cover in one day, but I hope I've given you at least a taste of all the great stuff that's coming down the pike for professionals to create the content that we consumers love to watch and listen to. So farewell from Las Vegas. Geek out.